guy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the guy. Right. And so uh, I've been here a long, long, long time. And it all, a lot, of, so a lot of it's still the same, some has changed. Um, a lot of the things that I remember are still intact. So it's nice to come home and be able to share with you again tonight uh, the Word of God for the people of God. Tonight we're going to look for our final lesson tonight. It comes from the Gospel of John. Chapter 19. This is coming from the crucifixion fiction experience of Christ. As everything was coming to an end for Him. John chapter 19, verses 28 through 30. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture will be fulfilled, Jesus says, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked it on a sponge and put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. And when he had finished the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Once and for all, this prayer. Again, O oh God, we have felt that stirring within us to come into your house. We have felt that longing to have fellowship with you. So we have arrived at this place, at this time, to hear your word. For we know you have a word for us. Sometimes it's the Pat us on the back, sometimes it's to stomp our toes, but most of the time it's to touch our hearts, to remind us that you love us, and that you are our God and we are the sheep of your pasture and you care for us. And so tonight we come, O oh God, to experience once again the outpouring of your Spirit among us, to unite us, to gather us together, to allow us to hear your word tonight that we may not only hear it, but we may believe it. And by believing it, we may live it. And by living it, we may share it. So speak, O God, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This past September, something wonderful happened in my life. I got married. In fact, I, I brought her Sunday night just to so yes, I did have a wife. Uh, Patty asked me not she does exist, doesn't she? Because she hadn't met her yet. Yes, she exists. And ever since our engagement at Christmas of 2020, that wedding experience and wedding planning consumed our lives. For nine months, from December to September, it seemed there was something to plan, something to put together, something to purchase, something to try on. This is why I tell couples elope. <laughs> but as you witnessed Sunday night, she exists and we survived the engagement process and the magical day arrived and the ceremony went off without a hitch. With the help of our officiating minister, my brother Chris Haynes, who was a pastor of the First United Methodist Church. Couldn't find a come a Presbyterian because they knew me they weren't going to do it. That's doing her a favor. It was a beautiful service, if I may say so myself. And the force was definitely with us as our very subtle Star Wars themed wedding exceeded all our expectations. We could not have asked for anything better for that day. But I will tell you that when all those festivity was over and everybody was gone and everything was taken down, we were exhausted. We looked forward to that long-awaited honeymoon starting on uh, Sunday morning. So that morning, we got up Del uh, Delonica, Georgia, here we come. What a beautiful place this is in North Georgia. If you've never been, you must go. You won't be disappointed. In fact, exceeding our expectations with all its waterfalls and the Appalachian Trail and the serene backdrop of where our cabin was. And when we arrived, we had some idea what we might do during the week, but we really didn't have anything in stone. We were just going to experience the moment in this time and place. Well, somewhere between breakfast and lunch on Monday as we were drinking our coffee from our newly uh, given Mr. and Mrs. coffee cups. Uh, 
I broke mine since then. Well, my phone dinged, which let me know that I was receiving a message. I thought, now everybody I know knows I'm on my honeymoon. Who in the world would be contacting me now? Imagine my surprise when I saw it was from Reverend Chris Haynes, the minister who did our wedding. I thought, what would he want? Imagine my surprise when I opened the text and I saw these words, oops, I goofed. <laughs> now, oops, I goofed are not the words a newlywed on his honeymoon wants to hear from the officiating minister. So immediately my mind says, how did he goof? Imagine my surprise as I continue reading the text which says, I just learned today that you cannot fill out a marriage license with blue ink, which is what I did. I think at that moment I let out a frantic squeal or a girl-like scream. So running in from the other room, Chris says, what's wrong? I yell, that Methodist minister. <laughs> sign our license in black ink and she was very worried and she says what does that mean and I responded we're not married <laughs> we were I think that is when Christy let out a frantic squeal and a girl like scream of her own now I have been in the ministry 36 years and I thought every minister knew to sign in black ink it even says so in the small print on the marriage license please sign in black ink I even laid this pen, which I know writes in black ink right beside the marriage license on my desk so that he would get it right. But no, no, he had to use a madness pen. <laughs> <laughs> and they wonder why the messes are having trouble. <laughs> oh, but there's more to the text. <laughs> So I scrolled down and Chris's next words were assuring. He said, but it's okay. You and Chrissy just need to stop by the courthouse on your way home to resign. I'm so sorry. I bet you are. <laughs> you see, because of that oops, I gooped. Christy and I were probably the only couple on their honeymoon with an asterisk beside their wedding day as if to say, you are married, but not so much. <laughs> So all that week, that became the standing joke about the blooming. In fact, if I got on Christie's nerves, which I seem to, to do a lot, she'd say, you know, we don't have to go by the courthouse on the way home. It's just blooming. <laughs> or, you know, it doesn't matter anyway because it's blooming. Or when I would sign the ticket for a meal, she'd look over and she'd say, is that blue or black? <laughs> so the first thing we did when we got back from Delonigo was to go by the court's office. When we walked in, the lady at the counter said, can I help you? And I said, uh, yes, where are the Joneses? And she started laughing and said, oh, we've been expecting you. <laughs> I'm sure you have. <laughs> she then handed me a copy of our new marriage license. And the first thing I did was to look for a brother at Christmas signature, just to make sure. The, the clerk laughed and she assured it was in black because he had actually refused very things and not one of those methods. <laughs> so armed with black pins from the clerk, we signed our new license and as far as we know, we are still legal. But it got me thinking. Brother Chris has been in the ministry for some time and he's done many weddings. And I thought, if he didn't know to sign in blank ink with our wedding, how many other couples experience the same thing we have? So to safeguard other unsuspecting couples from receiving such an unexpected message on their honeymoon, I gave Brother Chris a black pen <laughs> to use on his next wedding, which was guaranteed to write in black. In fact, I did it in front of his whole congregation at Holy Week service. And he said after that week, he got a hundred black pens. <laughs> I said, well, you'll never get it wrong in you. <laughs> See, that way when he signs the next license, it will be signed once and for all. Now, this phrase, once and for all, refers to something that is settled and final and permanent. It literally means this one final time which will serve forever. It is, when it is said, it is done, it is done. 
Nothing else is needed. Once was enough. Not going back to the clerk's office to resign. No more changing colors. So as we are finishing up our revival night, I want us to look at the last words spoken by Jesus on the cross, where he said, it is finished. Now, when we think about Jesus speaking his very last words on the cross, what is the it that is finished? Well, the first it is suffering, something Jesus understood all too well. Just in the last 24 hours before the cross, he endured the beatings and the lashings and the thorns on his head and the weight of the cross on his back. And if that weren't enough, there were the nails driven into his hands and his feet and the spear thrust into his side, the agonizing thirst that came. Yes, he understood the physical suffering, but there was more. For there was the emotional suffering, the denial by his loyal friends, the betrayal of his faithful and trusted followers. And there was the spiritual suffering, probably the worst of it all, the abandonment of his father, the power of suffering. And we all know it. We all have been there. We all know what suffering looks like. Just this last week, I was mowing my yard, which I finally got to. My neighbors are so happy now. As I made one of my last rounds in the front, discovered a yellow jacket's nest. They discovered me. One got me on this leg, one got me on this leg. And they were happy about it. I thought, oh, they must be Methodists. <laughs> I wonder if they had blue or black ink when they stung me. But I've darkened, yes, I suffered. I'm still suffering because my foot is swollen. You can't see it, but it's swollen. Because those little bitty troublesome creatures that God thought was funny. We've all suffered because of things we don't see coming our way, don't we? Sometimes we're swarmed. Somewhere we're overwhelmed by those things we don't see, but they're there. Some of you may remember Miss Irene Melton. She used to go to this church years and years ago. She was the aunt to Mr. Charles Barrett. She lived to be 98 years old, and she lived not far from here in Sedalia, Kentucky. Now, she had a wonderful spirit about her, so much so that when I felt down and out, I would make a trip to visit my Cyrene for a pick-me-up. Now, if there ever was a person who had any reason to gripe and complain about the pains and sufferings of living, it could have been Miss Irene. Because her eyes were so bad, her glasses were this thick. Her hearing was so low that she had AIDS in both ears. Her mobility was so slow that she got around using two walking sticks. She used to say, though, I can't see, I can't hear, I can't get around, but I'm not sick. That's an attitude about pain and suffering. I asked her one time, Miss Irene, you have lived a very long life. Do you have any regrets? She thought for a moment. She said, yes, I have one. I thought, you do? What is it? <laughs> she said, if I had known I was going to live this long, I would have got my teeth fixed. <laughs> You see, she only had two teeth in her head, one on the top, one on the bottom. But she was always happy that they met in the middle. <laughs> She's the only person I know that could eat an apple with two little teeth. Yeah. Miss Irene was a person who had so much physical suffering in her life to have been miserable. But she had so much in her life that was spiritual that she was so grateful. Now, you know now why well, I went to see Miss Irene when I was down and out. Because the longer I spent time with her, I didn't stay long that way. In fact, the longer I stayed, we'd be there till her son got home. And we'd be laughing and carrying on. And he'd come in and says, I can hear y'all outside. Well, hallelujah. <laughs> At least the neighborhood knows somebody is happy. Because if you were in Miss Irene's presence, you were going to be that way. This is the kind of attitude we should have about our suffering. And the good news is we can because Jesus understands our suffering. As Hebrews tells us, we do not have a high priest who has been tempted in every way that we are, but one who understands because he's been there. And it's because of this promise that we can approach the throne of grace and receive grace in time of need. Isaiah 53 said, He took upon himself our infirmities and carried our sorrows. He was considered smitten and stricken and afflicted. Yet by his wounds we are healed. By his sufferings we are made whole. 
I'm convinced that whatever suffering you are enduring right now, it will not have the last word in your life because the last word that Jesus spoke on the cross is, it is finished. The second it is sin. Now this is the power of Satan. It is a rebellion against the commands of God. It is a denial of living a holy life through immoral and unrighteous behavior. Someone the other day who knows me, he asked me, are you behaving? I said, I'm always behaving, but it's just not always well. <laughs> but not to confess my own sins. Sins are those things that box us up in our lives, that shut out the light of God's blessings. They prevent us from living the godly life that we are called to do. That's what sin does, you see. It divides creation from the Creator, the lover from the beloved, and the worshiper from the worshiped. Sin is one of the greatest tools that Satan has to keep us from being in a relationship with God. Sin, you see, sin is the blue ink. Sin is the blue ink. It's there. It makes you think all is well, but it's not right. It doesn't hold you. Somebody has to come and redo it. And that's when Jesus said, it is finished. Announcing through his own broken body and broken the power of sin and the suffering of it. On the cross, Jesus filled the other words of Isaiah 53, which says, He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. He bore the sins of many, and he made transgressions for the transgressors. Yes, temptations exist. You know, there's a temp the, 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 uh, people get confused temptation and sin. They want to say it's the same thing. But temptation is the, is the enticement to do wrong. But temptation doesn't become a sin until you are enticed. And a lot of folks are falling into the enticed category. But thanks be to God that Jesus came around and said, It is finished. Because, you see, temptations exist. Sin will happen. We, like sheep, will go astray. And we will fall short of the glory of God. But the power of sin no longer has power over you because the last word that Jesus said on the cross is, It is finished. Amen. Well, this leads us to the third it, and that is sacrifice. This is the power of death, the penalty and consequences of sin. Now, there's two sides of this idea of sacrifice. You see, unless these sins were atoned for, there could be no forgiveness and eternal death and separation from God was sure. The other side is that to secure this atonement from sin and death, something had to die in your place. A sacrifice, one without blemish or spot, one that was pure and innocent. And as John the Baptist reminds us, there goes Jesus, the one who is to take away the sins of the world. By taking away our sins, He became this sacrifice dying in our place. And it's no coincidence that John closes his account of Jesus' death with the words, it is finished. Because you see, the Greek word is telestia, which had been understood to be completion. But after much understanding of uh, tax receipts, they found it also to mean paid in full. You see, by Jesus' death on the cross, the debt of sin that we owe to God was paid in full once and for all. Hebrews 9 says, This is the blood covenant God commanded you. The law requires that everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary, nor did He enter heaven to offer sacrifices again as the way the high priest does. Because if that had happened, then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now He has appeared once and for all to do away with sin by the sacrifice of Himself. You see, the sacrifice of Christ was so perfect, nothing else was ever needed. Because of the sacrifice of Christ, there is no asterisk by our salvation, thank God. Because you see, Jesus got it right the first time. Because of the sacrifice of Christ, there are no redos and no resigns. Because Jesus got it right the first time, once and for all. And because of the sacrifice of Christ, there is no second guess in the relationship with God because Jesus assured it once and for all. So when Jesus spoke His last words from the cross, it is finished. He did so knowing there was nothing else to be said. 
As it said in John 9, my purpose was to do what the will of the Father who sent me and to finish His work. And on the cross, that work was finally done. Done was a suffering at the hands of sinful men. Done was sin's hold on creation. Done was a sacrifice for those sins once and for all. You see, it is finished. It's not a message of whoops, I goofed, but a proclamation of hope. Because Jesus knew that as His sacrifice on the cross was ending, the glory of the resurrection was just beginning. You see, it is finished was not a concession of defeat, but a proclamation of victory. Signed, sealed, and delivered once and for all. For all time, for all people, and for all sins. Thank God. And you know what? Jesus didn't care if it was black or blue. Because when He came to our salvation, He wrote in red. You see, there's nothing more powerful, more purposeful, and more permanent than the precious blood of the Lamb of Jesus. And it's through that blood, that love that was given to us, that He could say with all confidence, It is finished! And we, the kingdom of God, can now begin. So let us live in the new beginning that Jesus started when He ended it all. We thank you, O God, that you call us your bride, the church. That you came to save us with the sacrifice of yourself because you knew we were suffering under our sins and you came to finish it once and for all. You came to break Satan's hold on your bride and set us free. You have given us the victory because of what you did and what you said on the cross. Satan may have celebrated and hooped and hollered when he saw you die. But how he cringed when he heard you say, You're finished. <laughs> You're finished. And we know, oh God, that because we are your bride, you are coming again to claim us as your own and bring us unto yourself. We thank you, God, that you loved us so much. You shed your blood to claim us. To help us, oh God, to claim you. And to live for you in this world. Not that people will have to second guess who we are or who we belong to. But they will know that we are the bride of Christ. And through you, everything that we suffer, every sin that we endure, and every sacrifice we make, has come to an end, and we will live as glory people in your kingdom forever. Amen. 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 Number 317.